Thank you. Thank you. So it's such a pleasure to be here with Andrea, who is my journalism hero and friend. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I'm often asked if there's what journalists can do in this situation with this administration, where um, really, I mean, no matter what we do, we lose. Right? It's always it's always a net loss for journalism. No, it, it is always a net loss for journalism, right? It's a loss of access. It's a loss of information. Um, it's a loss of, of, of sort of trust, uh, uh, sort of trust. And uh, uh, but but the one example that I can always give of um, of a journalistic effort that that I think is successful and that actually finds the right approach to this administration is Trump Inc which is amazing. If you're not already listening to it, you have to start now. Um, and now there's this book, which is, which is an extraordinary accomplishment. And I, I don't understand how you did it while also doing the podcast. Mm. <laughs> uh, I was sort of observing the process. And then suddenly it was done, which, which was amazing. Um, For me too. <laughs> But uh, um, to start with, I actually want to, to ask you to read. I know, I know you have a good radio voice. <laughs> so um, could you read from the, the very beginning of the book, the section called The Wedding, uh, from page seven? Uh, start Absolutely. With, the um, wedding has its own internal alert. The Wedding, this is The Wedding of Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. The wedding had its own internal allure. The world of the celebrity apprentice was one of famous people who had seen better days, Dennis Rodman, Gary Busey, Deanne Warwick, Joan Rivers. There were actual movie stars at Jared and Ivanka's wedding, Princess pa Padme Amidala of the Star Wars movie franchise, Natalie Portman, and Maximus Decimus Meridius from Gladiator, Russell Crowe. Among the old dynastic families of New York real estate, when asked about Trump, people said, and still say, Donald Trump is not one of us. They say they never saw Donald Trump at the Real Estate Board of New York or at the Partnership for the New York City or the Alliance for a Better New York. They did not see him at civic events. They did not see him at charity balls or the ballet or the opera. With few exceptions, for example, the US Open Tennis Tournament in Queens, he stayed in his own homes, frequented his own clubs, and ate in the restaurants in his own buildings. By contrast, Ivanka Trump had found acceptance in the Manhattan elite. She went to the Chapin School on the Upper East Side and Choate Rosemary Hall Boarding School in Connecticut, and she studied at the School of American Ballet and danced as a child extra in the Nutcracker. As an adult, she was a sought-after supporter for causes from the World Wildlife Fund to the New York City Police Foundation. She was welcomed at the Met Gala and Vanity Fair parties and chatted about opera with Leonard Lopate on the public radio station WNYC. <laughs> Unlike her father and her husband, she had no hint of Queens or New Jersey in her measured speech. Somehow, through her, their accents were laundered. Ivanka and Jared's wedding was Jewish in a Trumpian way. <laughs> As women arrived, they were given elegant shawls to guard against the autumnal chill as the sun slid down the sky, but also to cover their shoulders. Ivanka herself wore a Vera Wang wedding dress, shoulders covered by white lace sleeves extending down to her elbows. In some dances, women were separated from men in the Orthodox tradition. The food, served in a separate dinner tent, also enormous, was kosher. A rabbi had walked through the tent, koshering a a caterer's, caterer's knife by dipping it in water. There was pastrami, corned beef, turkey, a sushi station, and Peking duck. A 13-layer cake that was almost as tall as the bride and groom, which is tall, ringed with cream-colored lysianthus, roses, peonies, lilies of the valley, and baby's breath. Charles Kushner's speech was a variant of the one he gave at every family event, every simcha. Yiddish and Hebrew for joy, a matanim for a joyous occasion, about being the son of Holocaust survivors, about the miracle of survival, about Jews thriving and prevailing, about the values of family and chesed, Hebrew for compassion or grace, and Torah. He spoke about Ivanka and how she had worked so hard to become Jewish and how the family embraced her now. 
Donald Trump had been bewildered by his daughter's conversion, but was gracious at his daughter's wedding. He spoke appreciatively and uncharacteristically of his first wife, Ivana, and all the work she had done to raise Ivanka, acknowledging he hadn't always been an attentive parent. The guests who had come to the wedding with a mix of curiosity and anticipation and obligation and appreciation were greeted warmly. They felt, for a fleeting instance perhaps, the gravitational pull of Donald Trump's personality. That night, as guests left clutching their giveaway prayer books and a pair of Javiana flip-flops that said, Jared on one and Ivanka on the other, <laughs> laced through with a string calling them a great pair, they were forced to embrace Trump's ostentatiousness, even as they participated in his display, to pay tribute to this marriage of money and power, to acknowledge the authority of the patriarchs. From the vantage point of everything they had built, the families could say, we've arrived. You are complicit in our power. We are a force to be reckoned with. Pay respect to us. Foolishly, the world did not. So as, <laughs> as you can tell, this is also a beautifully written book in addition to being an incredibly researched book. Um, but I want to talk about the title for a second. Mm. Uh, you call them American oligarchs. So let's define the terms. What's, what's an oligarch? So, um, Masha, <laughs> <laughs> I think I asked you that question. <laughs> Um, when I was starting writing this book, um, or even before I had started writing this book, uh, like many people after the 2016 election, which I had covered, uh, I didn't know what to do next. And I was trying to figure out what to do next. And we started on this Trump business reporting project and I kept running into Russian names. So I asked Masha, would she have coffee for me and explain what an oligarch was? Uh, and uh, so that was maybe six months before I started to write this book proposal, and I just hit on the title American Oligarch. So what do I mean by American Oligarch? I think what, I'm, what it is, is what we see in this Trump world, and especially in this real estate world of New York and New Jersey, but all over this country, where incredibly wealthy people uh, give the money to get the government they want. And one of the things that I really wrestled with in writing the book is that Trump and Kushner's are definitely, okay, so I don't really know how rich he is because I haven't seen his tax returns, <laughs> but I don't think Donald Trump or the Kushner's are the richest people in America by far. And they were not sort of players in the political scene the way the Koch brothers were, or the Olins, or the DeVosses, or the Princes, or any of those people who just really gave money to break the campaign finance system. But the Trump family and the Kushner family, but especially the Trump family, broke it in a different way. And the way was that Donald Trump and his father gave so much money to the political bosses and also had the system of compromise, like they would hire the people that would uh, work for the party bosses, they hired their lawyers, and they just always figured out the way in so they could use their money to get the government they wanted. Along with that was making sure that they would never suffer legal consequences, which enabled them to do this. And one of the things I learned in writing the book was that they broke it from within. So I didn't really know what an American oligarch was when I started writing the book, even though I had it in the title, but I think I understand it now, and I didn't know everything that was gonna happen in the two years since I started writing the book. But what we see is a system that, uh, where the very wealthy are making money faster and faster, and thanks to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, they're making it even faster, and then they have more money to give to a very transactional president who has made it so clear. I mean, every day people just pay this president, which is like a stunning to me as somebody who covered political corruption because it didn't happen that way. You don't, I spent so much time looking through campaign finance disclosures and lining them up and lining up the check numbers. And with Trump, it's just out there in the open. People are booking rooms at his hotels or golf course memberships or buying condos. And he is paying close attention. Now. 
I think that American oligarchs are not quite what I understand is happening in Russia with the oligarchs, because these are people who, as I understand it, are so beholden to Putin and their whole business model relies on their sort of supporting his government, not crossing him, and if they do, they will not make money or be killed or sent to jail or exiled or maybe all of those things, um, which is something that I learned from Man Without a Face, which is also a book that Masha wrote. Thank you. Uh, so I, we're not, that's not exactly where we are. However, one of the things that happened to me while I was covering Paul Manafort's trial that really shocked me was that during the trial, uh, one of the political consultants who had worked with Paul Manafort said, do you know who paid you? And he said, oh yes, very rich people. They call them oligarchs. And I thought, wow, that is crazy. There was no, I mean, there was no super PACs. There was no campaign finance system. There was nothing. They just paid for the consultant that was going to hire the president that they wanted that was going to enable them to keep making money. So we're not quite there, but that is the direction we are heading unfortunately. So you talk about the research for this book is starting six, well, right after the election, but it <laughs> right. didn't, right? right? When did the research actually begin? So I started, <laughs> I started covering corruption in, well, I started covering government in New York in 1994, which was the year Rudy Giuliani became mayor. And I, covered politics, election, government, um, but really what I wanted to do was understand how power worked. And so that is um, an endeavor that I've been doing for 26 years now. And one of the things about, um, I recently did a story for NPR, just sort of all this tape of Rudy through the ages. And uh, NPR was like, can you do the story? Can you find the time? which was you know, right around the time this book was supposed to be finished. Uh, and they said, look, once you pulled the tape together, you can use it for his obituary. And I was like, <laughs> oh my god, I've been covering Rudy Giuliani since he was mayor, and now apparently I'm going to cover him until he dies, not that he's on the verge of death, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the tape together. <laughs> oh, um, but talk a little bit more about how, um, I, I want you to talk about Wayne Barrett a little bit. And, and yeah, so while I, so I had, before I was a, a journalist, I worked in New York City government and politics. And I was sort of a low level official and I read the book City for Sale by Jack Newfield and Wayne Barrett. And I thought to myself, wow, this is how power works. And all of these people that lived in this world around me that did things, I had no idea. And I thought to myself, okay, I want to be like that. And many of you know Wayne Barrett. He was a legendary muckraking reporter, uh, a friend of mine. He really dedicated a large portion of his life to investigating Donald Trump. He was actually the first person to think, okay, Donald Trump is somebody worthy of a biography, a serious biography. And he also wrote two biographies of Rudy Giuliani. Uh, Wayne died on January 19th, 2017, hours before Trump was sworn, sworn in as president, uh, but has been a daily source of in inspiration to me because he was the kind of muck-raking, fact-based journalist who was willing to connect the dots uh, that has been a model for my career, and I actually think for many journalists who are working today. I remember we met up, I think, in early 2017. Mm. And, uh, and you sort of gestured around to, um, to, to lower Manhattan, where we were, and said, I think real estate holds the key. Yeah. I think if we just look at real estate, yeah. we're going to figure it all out. What made you think that? Well, so real estate in New York, we don't necessarily think of it this way, but it's like, it's like an energy or a mineral resource. It is a limited resource that is controlled by the government. And it is also, um, thanks to laws that uh, began, that Thomas Jefferson encouraged, of all people, there began this tradition in this country of keeping very detailed land records. So even though um, Donald Trump has figured out every way to not tell us things about 
his holdings, real estate records are extremely detailed, and you can find all kinds of things about them. One of the first stories that we did was um, about Paul Manafort's real estate deals. And what we had started doing is we were like, OK, we're going to look at Trump Tower and figure out all the people that live there. Uh, Mostly it was shell companies. So we tried to figure out who the shell companies were. We got up to apartment 43G, and that was Paul Manafort's apartment. And it was such a strange financing pattern. We tried to sort it out. And we went and we asked a bunch of excerpts, experts who would finance their apartment in this way. And they said, oh, well, that looks like money laundering. So we wrote that story. It, it was money laundering. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was money laundered from the oligarch in Ukraine that I mentioned. Uh, and Paul Manafort is serving prison time for it, which is one of the reasons that Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani went to Ukraine in the first place, because they wanted to undermine the basis of that conviction, even though it was tested in two federal jurisdictions. Uh, they believed that if they could cast doubt on Paul Manafort's uh, conviction, then they would cast doubt on the whole Mueller report. So shifting gears a little bit, um, most of the protagonists of this book are not people that you had access to for various reasons. Um, some are dead, hmm. and some wouldn't talk to you. Yeah. Uh, and some, I understand, received scores of questions from you. I mean, let me just sidebar this. So uh, many of you know that Masha, after um, the 2016 election wrote, Autocracy Rules for Survival. And one of the things she said is, expect there to be less and less press access, fewer and fewer press briefings. And for people who try to report on the administration to be retaliated in a way that makes it impossible to do their job. That was a fairly benign description of our current situation. We not only have we not seen the president's tax returns or know who his business partners are or who to whom he owes money, there are no visitor records at Mar-a-Lago or at the White House. There, it's much harder to get disclosures. They simply do not give us information. I mean, I think we see in this impeachment trial the way they have stonewalled Congress, but that is also what it's like to be a journalist. We just get nothing, and um, so I think that. Covering this administration has really, I mean, and the other thing also, of course, is that Donald Trump just, you know, bullies people, especially journalists. He calls journalists the enemies of the people, the enemy of the people, which is, as you know, not an accident. It's about undermining a potential source of a potential power source that he doesn't control. So a potential power source that he doesn't control is the truth. So <laughs> By trying to define everything as a matter of opinion, he undermines all of journalism. And I think that that is one of the things that I both tried to do in the book and tried to do uh, in, the, um, in the Trumping podcast is to sort of, by doing it, say, yes, actually, there is truth. There is an alternate power center. To the answer of access, I mean, one of the things that turns out to be incredibly interesting is that um, a lot of people in New York City and New Jersey know a Trump or a Kushner. It's amazing to me, particularly, I don't know if anybody here is from Livingston, New Jersey, but at almost every event that I've been to, including on the West Coast, somebody has come to me and said, I'm from Livingston, New Jersey, which is where the Kushner family is from, population 28,000. Uh, so uh, it has been. Uh, you know, I feel that I am blessed by the generosity of my sources who have spoken to me under, you know, a conditions of a lot of fear. And many of them have already suffered repercussions, and other ones were afraid that they would. Um, I sent separate questions to Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump, Charles Kushner, and Donald Trump. The Trumps just ignored me. The Kushners basically ignored all of my questions. And they did answer a few fact-checking, confirm, or correct type of questions. Uh, so I had a little bit of that, but that's all that I got from them. So two follow-ups to that. First of all, did they answer those truthfully? Ha! <laughs> well, 
Uh, so far as I could tell, yes. But one of the questions to Jared Kushner was, you graduated from Harvard in the class of 2003, correct? And um, he ans the answer was, with honors. <laughs> so I was like, OK, I'm going to put that in the book, because I was sort of tough on Jared Kushner. And he got into Harvard after his father gave a huge contribution. His father did not go to Harvard. Um, but then, shout out to my excellent fact checker, Fergus McIntosh. He found out that 91% of the people in the class of 2003 had graduated with honors, so I didn't put it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true, right. but. <laughs> um, but did you feel like it was, and, and, I'm, and I'm asking this actually because I, I've written some about people that I also didn't have access to, and sometimes it feels like an advantage because you're not beholden to somebody's version. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that it is harder when, I mean, it's hard when somebody gives you a lot of access because, I mean, I feel an incredible sense of responsibility to, to everybody that's in the book to all the people that spoke to me and to everybody that's in it to really, really try and get it right. Um, but I think that knowing how these families work, the people that work with them, they give up so much of themselves. And it's one of the major themes of the book is everybody gets close to them, compromises themselves in some way, and then can't go back. Not a journalist, but an example of this is Michael Cohen, who um, talks in some testimony that I have in the book about how Trump kept asking him to cross lines. And every time he crossed a line, he would ask him to cross another line. And then he was so far over, he could never go back. And then when Michael Cohen testified to Congress and they were attacking him and defending Trump, he said, I was you. Don't do what I did. Because then you will find yourself in the position that I'm in, which is serving three years in prison right now. Right, so you're saying that's the advantages that you, you're not I'm risking three that, years in prison. I'm saying that, right, I mean, with, with, especially with Donald Trump, like the whole history of his um, relationship with journalists is that um, he beguiles journalists. And there's a lot of examples in the story about how he like gave sports tickets to people and then they couldn't cover him anymore. Right. And he would do things to bring people close to him. I mean, he didn't treat journalists any differently from the way he did anybody else. And then if people, if he didn't like the stories, he would threaten to sue them. And this goes back forever, um, and did sue them. So talk, uh, I want to talk about Trumping for a minute, um, because what I, what I most appreciate about it is that it has, I mean, first of all, it's an open-ended, you call yourself mm. an open-ended investigation, um, which I think is brilliant. And your project is very clearly to describe Trumpism as a system. Yeah. And, um, I just want to make it clear just how different it is from the normal sort of journalistic project. How did you, I mean, how different is it, and how, and how did you come up with this idea? So, we came up with the idea, so this is something, so right after Trump was elected, it became very clear that we were going to have to work with a lot of other journalists because the system was so complicated. And there was how, I mean, you could spend a year investigating one shell company that gave to the Trump inaugural. So it became clear that we were going to have to cooperate in a way that we were not used to cooperating. I mean, we didn't have to, but it would be better to do that because there was so much material to go through. We would just be wasting our time if we would be competing with each other over diving into these business records. So we started to reach out to a lot of journalists, and we created this partnership with ProPublica, and we did some stories about, I think one of the first stories we did was how Don Jr., Ivanka, and Donald Trump were still on the Trump Soho liquor license while they were in the White House, which meant if a high school student bought a drink at the bar at the Trump Soho, the President of the United States would be liable for that. <laughs> uh, so, but we started to do a number of stories with them, and then, we did this story about the Trump Soho. This was another meeting that I had with Masha because I wanted to know how to pronounce all the Russian names. <laughs> and I wanted to understand why the emigres who lived in Brighton Beach were doing business back in Russia. And the story ended up being nothing to do with that and totally in my old haunting grounds, which was the New York City Board of Elections records. Because what had happened is that the Trump, there, were, there was an email chain showing that the 
Trump adult children had lied about the number of units sold at the Trump Soho and uh, did it knowingly, and which is a violation of various laws in New York, felony laws. So they were being investigated by the Manhattan DA and Trump's white collar team, well connected I should add, one of them was the brother-in-law of the former DA and one was a law partner of the DA or former law partner of the DA, but they couldn't make the case go away. So they brought in Trump's personal attorney, Mark Kazowitz, who often also happened to be one of the largest donors to the Manhattan DA and uh, the case was closed over the objection of the prosecutors. So we did this story with ProPublica and The New Yorker, and then afterwards we sat down and we thought, okay, we should follow up. So we put on a big whiteboard all of these questions, and we were looking like, what are we gonna do? We wanna understand this deal, we wanna understand that deal, we wanna understand Trump India. And then we realized, actually, the question is the story. And that is what Trump Inc. came out of. It's a set, it's an open investigation, which has turned out to be, I mean, people love the idea of an investigation. One of the stories that we have not yet solved partly because Trump has sued to block the subpoenas that might have shed light, is what was happening with his connections with Deutsche Bank in the period prior to the election. And we did an episode saying, well, we don't know what happened. Literally, we don't know what happened. We don't know if there was money laundering, but we are gonna tell you all of the strange things that have happened with Deutsche Bank. Like they were, at the time that they were doing business with Trump, they were sanctioned by New York regulators for doing hundreds of millions, for laundering hundreds of millions of dollars from Moscow to London and New York. So all of this was going on at the same time. They had no money laundering controls. And when, we, when I started the, edit, the episode, and we have a very intensive editing process, and one of the editors said, I think you need to tell people that you don't know what the end of the story is. So that is sort of thematically what Trump is, is we don't know what the end is, but we are involved in this process of unraveling and documenting and bringing people in to help us solve it. Many people that have, we have reported on have been indicted or gone to prison after we wrote about them. Sometimes it seems to be happening so fast that we um, can't keep up, so. I mean, we wrote about Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, and then the next thing we know, they were indicted in the Southern District of New York. <laughs> um, I want to ask you to read some more. Yes. So um, this section is called Dirt, and it's, it's the end of the section. Start. I feel like I need to explain something um, before I read this. So Jared Kushner's grandmother was a survivor of the Holocaust. And she lived in a town called Novogrodzik in northeast Poland, where she had been middle to upper middle class, and there was a pretty thriving Jewish community there. And her family was subject to all kinds of brutality, mass murders, shootings. There were tens of thousands of Jews in the area. By the summer of 1943, there were hundreds. And one of the things that I found remarkable from reading Jared Kushner's grandmother's testimony, because she had left this testimony as part of this movement where people felt we need to document what happened in the Holocaust um, so that it wouldn't happen again. And one of the things that I found so striking was how she kept talking about whatever happened they were like, this is the worst thing that can happen. So the worst thing that could happen is that the Soviet Union could take over. And then the next worst thing that could happen was the Nazis could take over and make them wear yellow stars and walk in the middle of the street. But surely it couldn't get worse than that. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So from tens of thousands of Jews to 300 Jews, they finally came to the realization that they were going to die, that they had not been chosen by God to live, the Nazis were gonna uh, kill them as soon as they were done with them. So they dug a tunnel. They used spoons or whatever they could find, forks, and they dug out bags of dirt and they hid it in the wall so the Nazis wouldn't know that they were building a tunnel and one night on the eve of the Jewish High Holy Days, they all crawled out, two foot wide tunnel, and 
they crawled out maybe the length of three football fields, which is a, probably a good metaphor for tonight. And they got under the barbed wire and everybody got out. Now some of the people, including Jared Kushner's grandmother's brother, ran in the wrong direction and were killed by the Nazis. So all of that is important for you to know before I read this part. This part is about Jared Kushner right after the election. At this time, it wasn't even clear to many Americans that Jared Kushner would be joining the administration. But the Russians had figured out that Jared had rare influence over his father-in-law. Putin kept opening fronts in his maneuvers to reach Jared. In addition to Avin and Dmitriya, two oligarchs, he sent his ambassador, Sergei Kis Kislak. <laughs> no, now Masha's making me say all the Russian names out loud. <laughs> Kislak, to create a third channel. Kushner agreed to meet even though after the election he said he couldn't remember Kislak's name. Kushner has offered this as evidence. He couldn't have colluded with Russia during the campaign. On November 30th, Kislak, Kushner, and Michael Flynn, the incoming national security advisor, met at Trump Tower. Flynn, it later emerged, had secretly accepted $600,000 from a firm linked to the Turkish government for lobbying work that coincided with the campaign. I asked Ambassador Kislak if he would identify the best person, whether the ambassador or someone else, with, whom, with whom to have direct discussions and who had contact with his president, Kushner later said. Kislak did have someone he wanted to speak with Kushner, his generals. He asked Kushner if there was a secure communications line they could use. Kushner came up with a suggestion. How about if they used the communications equipment at the Russian embassy? This was a shocking suggestion to shocking suggestion to Kislak that the incoming American administration, albeit a friendly one, could get access to Russia's most secret methods of communications, its inner sanctum. Alarmed, he said no. He transmitted his alarm to Moscow. These communications were monitored and recorded by U.S. intelligence agencies. That's how they found out the president-elect son-in-law's talks with the Russian ambassador. Kislak pursued Jared for yet another meeting. Jared was by now impatient. He decided that Kislak didn't really have enough juice with Moscow. But Kislak was persistent and set up a meeting with Jared's assistant. At that meeting, Kislak asked for an yet another appointment with Jared. This time, as Kushner put it, with a person named Sergei Gorkov, who said he was a banker, the head of Veneshikonom Bank, or VEB, the Russian state-owned development bank. Gorkov, Kushner was told, had a direct line to the Russian president who could give insight into how Putin was viewing the new administration and best ways to work together. So they met. I agreed to meet Mr. Gorkov, Jared later wrote, because the ambassador had been so insistent, said he had a direct relationship with the president, and because Mr. Gorkov was only in New York for a couple days. I made room on my schedule for the meeting that occurred the next day on December 13th. Kushner saw no conflict for the son-in-law of the incoming American president, a real estate developer with a billion dollar debt coming due, to meet with a banker for the Russian state to talk about foreign policy. The meeting took place not in Trump Tower, but at Tom Barrack's Colony Capitol Building in Manhattan. At the time of the meeting, VEB was and remained the subject of US sanctions imposed in the wake of the Crimea invasion. Gorkov told Kushner a little about his bank and the Russian economy. He said he was friendly with President Putin, Kushner said, and expressed disappointment with U.S.-Russia relationships under President Obama and hopes for a better relationship in the future. There were no discussions about sanctions, Kushner said, or about my companies, business transactions, real estate projects, loans, banking arrangements, or any private businesses of any kind. VEB disputed this characterization telling the Washington Post that the session was held as a part of a new business strategy and was conducted with Kushner in his role as the head of his family's real estate business. When questioned by Mueller's investigators, Jared Kushner wanted to make sure they understood how little he thought of this meeting, to advance his argument that he couldn't have been conspiring with Russian state actors. He said he did not engage in any preparation for the meeting and that no one on the transition team even did a Google search for Gorkov's name. But Gorkov, another of Putin's wealthy and powerful emissaries, had done his research. Gorkov carried with him two gifts, gifts that showed a careful and deliberate investigation into the person he was meeting with. One was a piece of art from Novogrudik, the village where my grandparents were from in Belarus. And the other was a bag of dirt from that same village, as Jared Kushner later explained. During the campaign, 
dirt on Hillary Clinton had been the currency Russians had tried to trade. Now the Russians were giving Jared Kushner a literal bag of dirt, reminiscent of the bags of dirt that Ray Kushner and her family had dug from the earth and hidden in the walls of the Novogritic ghetto so the Nazis wouldn't know they had dug a tunnel to safety. Had it not been for those bags of dirt, Ray would have never made it out of the ghetto to the forest, to the refugee camp, or to New York, where she had four children, including one named after her brother who died during the escape, and whose own son, Jared Corey Kushner, was now one of the most powerful people in a new and uncertain world, slinking again towards darkness. <laughs> So like I said, it's, it's an incredibly written book. Uh, and it, you know, it's such an interesting thing to bring that kind of melancholy mm -hmm. writing to an investigative project. But I wonder what it felt like to, to research and write. Yeah, it was really hard. I mean, it was really hard. The hard, well, there were a couple of things that were really hard. One of the really hardest parts was um, I didn't really know that much about the Holocaust in Poland. And I had known about Jared Kushner's grandmother's testimony, and I was speaking to a friend of mine who knows more about Holocaust studies than I do, and he said, well, is it true? And I said, wait, what, it wouldn't be true? And he said, no, and I realized, okay, I have to, I have to report this the way I would report anything else. Um, so I did. I listened to her sister's testimony. I went to the Holocaust Research Center. I asked them for every testimony from everybody else who had survived and gotten out through the tunnel. And I read all the testimonies. Um, largely, I mean, they, the stories matched up. And Jared Kushner's grandmother's story largely was true. There were some places where people sort of disagreed about numbers. But I mean, who could know? Did something happen to 20 people? Did something happen to 50 people? The essential facts, everybody told the same story. So I said, OK, that is, that is true. But it was hard, hard to listen to that. And especially Ray Kushner describing her growing dread. For example, she talked about how when she was a teenager, they heard stories about Germans coming into southern Poland and killing Jews. And their response was, that can't be happening. Who would do that? So it was hard really getting deep into the details of this and watching what is going on now, which is not the Holocaust, I want to be clear, but many of the initial conditions for the Holocaust to happen, like the assault on truth, like an ascent, uh, sort of set of or sense of moral relativism, that there's no right, there's no wrong, that anything goes so long as you have the majority of people saying that it goes. Sort of seeing that on two tracks was, was difficult. It's, I mean, now that the book is out in public and, every, and I have been able to share the story, it's, it feels easier and easier to tell it because uh, it was much harder to sort of be alone in that world of listening to all of those testimonies and so, so deep in. And um, it, never, it never got easier. This month, we did an episode of our podcast, Trump Inc., in which we had tape from Jared Kushner's grandmother's various testimonies. And I had to stop in the middle of tracking and go outside and take a walk because it was so intense and difficult to listen to the story of what happened to them. So that's, I mean, that's, an, that's a really difficult um, challenge for a writer to, you know, to, in, to inhabit that world, right, of, of, of tragedy. Um, and then there's a different challenge, which is to inhabit the world of extremely unlikable people. Yeah. But like, these extremely <laughs> unlikable people have this tragic backstory. Yeah. And I don't even understand how you wrap your mind around I mean, that. I think, so um, American Oligarchs is a story in five acts. And I think that one of the things I've learned from other stories that are in five acts is that people are incredibly complicated. And there's no simple sense of somebody is sort of good forever and their ancestors are good forever or because this horrible thing happened to somebody, they are a good person. Uh, and I wanted to tell 
all of the moral complexities in this story. And I, I mean, you know, standard journalistic practice of wanting to know what is, what is the good uh, in these people and in their background. So, um, and then I also think, I mean, the other thing is, is that it's a story about democracy, which I think is so important because it's a story about the decisions that have been made as a country by a bipartisan group of elected officials that have eroded our system and eroded our system. And each time there was a body blow to the system. I mean, you know, when I started covering campaign finance and corruption, it was so easy because you'd go and you'd look up a campaign contribution and then you'd look what happened to, you know, what could that have possibly $75,000 contribution bought? And then you would find something like, oh yes, it was the, uh, scoping study for the East Side Access Project for the MTA. And there's always some, it wasn't hard. It was like shooting fish in a barrel once you sort of figured out the system. It is so hard now because the systems have been so broken down. And each time the systems have been broken down, people have said on a bipartisan level, okay, we'll figure out a way to weather this. But no, I mean, I think that the answer is, you know, this is the 10th anniversary of Citizens United decision and our democracy really has not weathered that decision. So um, it's not like it's a story with a happy ending, um, but it's a story that I felt compelled to tell. The other thing was, is that I got sort of obsessed with the Broadway show, Hades Town, um, which is a story where, you know, you know basically from the first minute that it's gonna have a terrible outcome and you read it believing that actually Orpheus is not gonna look back and it's all gonna be good and they're gonna get out. And then he doesn't, because that's the Greek myth. It's not really a spoiler alert. And then they tell it again. And I felt like that's the sort of place that I felt like I just have to tell this story because what else can I do? And one of the many things I appreciate <laughs> about the book is that you keep reminding the reader that you actually have to think about you know, how we think about democracy, how we think about mm. taxes, how we think about wealth, how we think about social equality, and that, it, and that Trump is not, in that sense, an aberration. Right? That we've been, totally not. We've, we've been on, yes. on this road for a long time. Um, what, I know a lot of questions remain open for you at the, mm. at the end of the book, but um, give us a couple that you really want to get answers to. Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, I would like to see Trump's tax returns. And I would really, <laughs> really like to understand his business. Um, you know, there are so many, I mean, one of the things, and I understand this is a very, very emotional week for, for a lot of people. I mean, it's one thing to know that the Senate is going to acquit the president, and it's another to see them doing it. Uh, and, and have that actually experienced. But this is not, we're not yet at the end of the, of consequences, but we're sort of hanging, you know, it's kind of like one of those movies where somebody is like hanging over a cliff and somebody's holding onto them by one arm and that they're about to fall out. Like that's sort of where we are because three cases are going to the Supreme Court, uh, including the one where Trump's lawyer is arguing that he can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and not even be investigated so long as he's president. I was in the courtroom when Trump's lawyer said that and I went and I wrote a story and I went on the radio and I was like, Trump's lawyer said he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and not be investigated. And then I got off the air and I was like, could what I have said to six million people be true? Can that be right? Is that what they said? So I had to go back and like listen to the whole thing to make sure I hadn't gotten it wrong. No, I hadn't gotten it wrong. So Trump lost that case. The Second Circuit ruled, no, you, that is not the case. That is, you know, it is repugnant to our constitutional system. And, you know, there was another decision, another case where a judge said the president is not king. So these were not ambiguous lower court decisions, federal court decisions, circuit court decisions, and the Supreme Court took them anyway. So they're hearing them on March 20th. They'll rule at the end of this term. And for me, I think like that is the biggest remaining question is what happens because if the Supreme Court rules that the president cannot even be investigated, I, I just don't know. I mean, I think the judicial bans has been really good. Um, 
there have been a lot of really good lower court decisions that have helped us get out information and release facts. But if the Supreme Court rules that, I think we will be in even worse trouble than we're in now. And I have a scarier question for you. Mm. <laughs> before, before we go to, 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 to audience questions, one last one. So, uh, you know, the, uh, I, it's you like, focus? what could be scary to you, Masha? You wrote a story, a book about totalitarian, totalitarian, totalitarianism reclaiming Russia. It's sort of right. like. Uh, well, actually, it's also a great book. book. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, you decided to look at this uh, at, at, at the coming together of the Kushners and the Trumps, mm -hmm. which is not actually what produced our current president. Yeah. Right. Um, and I have to ask. I mean, are you thinking that that's the future? The, I, and, you know, I'm not asking you to, to yeah. predictions, but just to sort of I, talk through the logic. I mean, I will say this. I don't. So I got out of the prediction game November 9th, 2016. And I covered, you know, six national presidential elections, so going back to the 90s, and, and so many other elections. And when you cover elections, the basic thing that people want you to know, want to know, is who's going to win. So every story you do has to sort of somehow feel like people are getting an answer to that question. And that is what happens in campaign coverage. I don't know who's going to win, but I do think that Trump has uh, taken over the Republican Party, has commandeered mechanisms of democracy with help from a lot of you know, wealthy people who believe in gerrymandering and who uh, you know, believe in voter suppression, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, we're, I mean, I think that the answer to oligarchy is always more democracy. So I think that, you know, I, I don't feel hopeless about that. Um, but I think people should take it very, very seriously. I also think that, um, since implied in your question is, what about Ivanka Trump? Um, I, as, I mean, I read all of Ivanka Trump's social media feeds and watched. Someone had to. Watched <laughs> so many episodes of The Apprentice, so many. And um, one of the things that I've noticed about Ivanka Trump is, you know, she speaks like someone who believes like she could run for office someday. And she's very careful in what she says. You will notice that Ivanka Trump almost, she's not like Don Jr. who, by the way, Don Jr., okay, I just have to say, Don Jr. had $94,000 bulk buy from the RNC of his book. So he would be a bestseller, which is like the most Trumpian story ever because it's like manufactured success being, uh, presented as actual success, which is supposed to generate more success. Um, but so I only have you all, not $94,000 from the RNC, so please buy a lot of books tonight. And buy, if you have one, buy one for your friends. OK, so that's the end of the commercial. But Don Jr. is a very, when he speaks, he's very dark, very, very dark. Um, Ivanka Trump is not. Ivanka Trump talks in this upbeat way about the economy is going great, the Trump Tax cuts have been great for working class people. She talks in an, in an empathic way. There was a study about people who, if they had a $400 bill, it would destroy them economically. Um, but she presents as if the Trump uh, economic plans were somehow a solution to these problems. And she talks about, I mean, she went to Africa and she poses with children and she, uh, went to India and talked about all that her administration had done for women and minorities. And so she acts like somebody who um, is preserving her options. That I can say. <laughs> okay, so we have audience questions. One is, do you have any insight into why so many Americans being hurt by Trump budget continue to support him? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, really complicated because, I, I mean, I think a whole huge big theme of this book is immigration and refugees. And uh, I think w what has happened is that there's a transferring of blame, which is, um, so people think if there's something is going badly, it's because of immigrants and refugees. And if something is going well, it's because of Trump. And then I also think it's because of, you know, this constant stream of spin about 
how much better things are. So I think that people have a sense of um, hanging on to something which is, which is not their experience, but wanting so badly to believe it because Trump has done such a good job of selling that he is the person who is their savior. What is the role of privatization and deregulation in Trumpism? Yeah, well, I mean, I do think that it's everything to do with oligarchy. And oh, by the way, I feel like I need to say, the last word of my book is hope. And it's not, um, I mean, I, I really tried to make that hope earned. Like I didn't just say, okay, here is 400 pages of uh, darkness and now have hope. So, um, so you'll have to read to the end of the book to find out how I, I get to that um, argument. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the role of privatization yes. and deregulation. So I, thank you right. for so I, I know why I thought about that. Because in my epilogue, I talk a lot about sort of oligarchy and uh, sort of nativism being two heads of a hydra. And what is going on with Trump, with the destruction of government, is that he is increasingly turning over the power and the money, which for him are so intertwined, to a group of private businessmen. So the insiders can stay on the inside and everybody else is on the outside. And that is the model of the Trump presidency. So uh, everything that he does to privatize, to deregulate, is all about giving the favors to the very, very wealthy, who are then in turn going to come back and do things for him. And I mean, I think we already see this. We see this with some of the people who control the biggest companies in America, Facebook, Apple. They are not confronting Trump. Google, they're, they're just not. And, as, and that is sort of how we are seeing the system play out of privatization, deregulation. They can roll up their wealth even faster and faster. And it's totally related to the destruction of government because the tax bill, job, the Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017 has, is going to create a trillion dollar deficit this year. And so there is sort of no money to run the government. And then everything becomes you know, in the hands of private business people. Who do you think funded and inserted Parnas and Fruman into Trump's orbit, and why? Uh, so we have, um, I don't know the answer, um, but we have an episode of our podcast called The Diplomat, The Mahers, and The Oligarchs, um, which shows, it's, yeah, it's good. It has, it has uh, even a song from Fiddler on the Roof in it, you'll see. Um, and uh, you, I mean, almost certainly there are, I mean, we know that there are financial interests involved now from what Parnas has said and from the deals that he was doing and we heard him talk to the president about it. I don't know how many people have listened to, to that tape, but it was extraordinary. So Trump is at a super PAC, which he's not actually supposed to be really coordinating with, but all these rich people come and they're like, we want this, we want that. And Parnas was talking about, I wanna do these energy deals in Ukraine. So we already know that there were financial interests. We know that Parnas was working for a Ukrainian oligarch named Dmitry Firtash, who has been indicted in the United States for violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, and has been fighting extradition, extradition since 2015 in Vienna and who sees as his personal enemy Joe Biden because he believes that Joe Biden is responsible for his prosecution. So um, there's at the very least a coincidence of interest between Firtash, Parnas, Rudy Giuliani, and Donald Trump. Last audience question. Can you talk about trust and who these two families tend to trust, often to their own and our detriment? Well, I mean, Trump trusts himself first. Uh, he trusts his family, he trusts you know, his son-in-law. I mean, I think one of the reasons that Jared Kushner is sort of this enormously powerful person is because he comes from a family where loyalty is valued and he, va and he is, extremely uh, faithful to his father-in-law. Also, one of the things that we've learned disturbingly is that 
a lot of the information and the narrative that Trump is discussing about Ukraine, he got directly from Putin or Viktor Orban. We just, that is actually fact now, which is kind of startling. And, and he told people in his government, well, where'd you learn this? Oh, I learned it from Viktor Orban or I learned it from Vladimir Putin. So I think that um, if you've read any of Masha's books, I think you will know that Vladimir Putin is not a trust, trustworthy source. Um, and yet that does seem to be who is informing our president at this moment. And disturbingly, I mean, one of the things that's very disturbing about this impeachment trial, so I mean, it was sort of a fascinating and disturbing thing because there was all of this testimony from all of these US government officials and I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never really understood how the mechanisms of government worked. Uh, and how diplomacy was done. And Fiona Hill, John Bolton's chief of staff, which is like such historically so hard for me to get my head around. But she said, this is Russian propaganda. Don't believe it. And people just simply rejected that. They were sort of like, eh, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear. And that was sort of the way that Congress has reacted. So I think it is. Um, a really good question to ask where President Trump gets his information. And I think it is why it is so important to, and I don't think I'm alone in this. I think there's a lot of journalists that are trying to document what's going on. But the fourth estate is in the Constitution. And I think that you know, I feel an obligation to keep doing the kinds of things that I do uh, because it creates the possibility of a future where truth will be embraced once again. We're once again ending on a hopeful note.